Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q, and in this video I'm going to take an in-depth look at the Tier 8 American Premium Heavy Fighter, the Lockheed XP-58 Train Lightning. Hello there, and first I'd like to thank Twitch follower Marco Polo 42 for requesting the subject of this video, which, as you can see on the tarmac outside my hangar, is the XP-58. And this was variously intended as a long-range escort fighter, or a grand attacker, um, but it never got past a single prototype. There were incessant problems with the engines. Um, it wasn't actually trialed by the uh, Air Force and the project was cancelled. And this uh, is a late stage design concept, uh, as is shown by the fact that there is a bottom and a top uh, turret at the rear. The original concept was for maneuverable machine guns uh, in the uh, tail booms, at the end of the tail booms quadruple 37mm cannons, uh, which could have been a 75mm cannon. Of course, that would have been a thing in this game, wouldn't it? A 75mm cannon. And this is a premium aircraft. It's one that's always available in the shop at Tier 8. And it's a popular choice, and with good reason. So the next thing to do is go and look at the numbers for this aircraft. Uh, but if you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, then use the link below the video to skip ahead to another section. And here's the spreadsheet showing all of the Tier 8 heavy fighters, uh, and there are eight of them, as you can see. I'm going to take a moment to explain how this spreadsheet works. Again, if you know that already, use the link below to skip ahead to the discussion of the statistics themselves. So the XP-58 Chain Lightning occupies columns C and D. Each of the other seven heavy fighters have their own two columns, as you can see, going progressively to the right. Down the left, we can see the information from the hangar UI, supplemented as usual by some information from a third party website concerning the guns auto aim angle dispersion angle and overheat time i think overheat time is self-explanatory auto aim angle is the amount the game helps you to hit your target when you're slightly off target dispersion angle is the spread of your bullets so they leave leave the muzzle of your machine gun or cannon uh, for the purposes of the comparison the aircraft was stripped back to stock configuration. Ordnance where available was mounted. Doesn't apply to this particular aircraft, the XP-58. There isn't any. Uh, equipment was taken off. Pilot sent back to the barracks. It's all top modules. Color coding, best in class is indicated by green color. Uh, light blue, second best in class, light purple, third best in class. A gold color behind the name of the aircraft indicates that it is a premium or a reward aircraft, as indeed the XP-58 is. And then we reverse the logic using red colors for worst in class figures down here. Yeah. Okay. Let's make a start on the numbers. And beginning with the armament, the business end of the aircraft, it's pretty good news. Um, the rating is 55, second best in class. The cumulative DPS is 800, which is also second best in class. It's only bettered by the very hard hitting uh, Westland P1056. Um, and what we have, I did mention in the first impressions section, was uh, four 37 millimeter cannons, each outputting 200 DPS. Uh, rate of 120, so fairly decent, uh, but here's the first thing that you need to take a note of. Only 1,837 foot range, and you'll see that I've uh, acted to compensate for this relatively short range um, when I've set the aircraft up, which we'll see shortly. Uh, this auto angle, fairly reasonable 2.5 degrees, so if you're off by 2.5 degrees, the game will correct your aim for you and you will still hit your aircraft. Dispersion angle 0.6, which is getting on for a little bit high for a cannon, but nothing unusual. Just means that the accuracy isn't as great as you might like on some of the aircraft. You can see, for instance, the Pancake has 0.5. And some of the snipers, as is usual for sniper guns, which are meant to operate at extremely long ranges, are actually 0.2 for the BVP-203 uh, 30mm, and even a 0.1 for the uh, uh, single 30mm cannon on the Tornier 335A1 file. Overheat time, 6 seconds, so you need to be a little bit careful about being trigger happy. As far as rear armament is concerned, um, as we've seen, there are quite clearly four guns at the back of the aircraft. Uh, however, the game actually uh, records this as a single 12.7 millimeter machine gun, 128 range, uh, 28 DPS with two, nearly 2,300 foot range, which is pretty decent and can be improved. Again, this is probably enough to get bots, particularly light fighters, off your tail. Um, and if you configure your gunner correctly, you might even be able to deter some humans as well, but it's not going to save you from a determined heavy on your tail. 
And really the, exp the, the armament here is all um, everything about this aircraft, because if we go to the ordnance section, what are we going to find? Well, no ordnance. So you are simply not going to be taking out um, ground targets very often, unless it happens to be a soft a portion of soft target, which is needed to flip a sector. Uh, so that should um, begin to make you think that this is a true air superiority heavy. Survivability figures are excellent, uh, largely best in class. Uh, and this aircraft can really take some punishment. However, you don't really want it to and to do that because it's not necessary, as we'll see shortly as well. Airspeed. Uh, the airspeeds of all of the heavies are, I'm going to say, much of a muchness. Uh, the ME262 is the, the best of the lot uh, in terms of its speed, but it's not by a massive amount. As you can see, the cruise speeds for the two are fairly similar, for instance. It's the boost speed for the ME262, which is uh, key here, makes it very quick. But that means you need to manage the boost. That's at 484. It's sort of uh, getting on for the top end of the, the um, range uh, here. So the XP chain lightning will stay with the other heavies long enough to be able to shoot them down, even with a short range weaponry. Uh, 30 seconds, again, sort of in the middle. Um, not as good as the BBP 203. Mind you, that does need long boost because its main escape um, method is to fly straight and horizontal as quickly as possible. And the dive speed. Unusually for a Lightning, you might have expected this to be somewhere near the top of class. It's not. Um, so bear that in mind. Diving away from some of the other heavies won't get you away from them necessarily. Uh, Maneuverability, uh, it scores pretty well. Third best in class. Uh, the Lightnings themselves, uh, the Tech Tree ones, you'll know are very maneuverable heavies. Uh, although they've been left behind a little bit by the introduction of the Japanese heavies and particularly the nasty XB-54. Uh, nonetheless, this is very usable uh, maneuverability and you might even consider improving that rather than trying to improve, for instance, speed uh, and making this even more flexible. Uh, but beware, do not try and outmaneuver twin Mustangs. You will lose. And if you come against uh, a good human player in either a Dorney A335 or a Pancake, you'll have your um, work cut out trying to outmaneuver them as well. But you might give it a go. Depends on how you built the aircraft. The other uh, uh, heavies, um, you should be able to outmaneuver fairly easily. And altitude performance again. Uh, with the exception of the Westland, and that really is concentrating more on ground attacking um, as a component of its play uh, than it is pure air superiority, and also the Pancake, the Altitude before, and also the Twin Mustangs, which again, you're going to be concentrating largely, I say largely, a significant component of your play will be uh, concerned with taking out ground targets. Therefore, the altitude performance is not so important for these aircraft. It is important for something like the XP Chain Lightning, which doesn't have ordnance, and it's up there with the rest of the air superiority aircraft. As you can see, the figures are pretty similar. Um, we just quickly look at worst in class figures before I give you my opinion of how to uh, how to use this aircraft. Well, clearly, as far as ordnance concerned, it's worst in class because you simply haven't got any ordnance. Um, Compression on the survivability figures mean that you don't need to worry too much about the damage resistance and fire resistance being in red here. As you can see, it's true for all of the aircraft, and that's pretty much true for some of the other aircraft uh, uh, st statistics on airspeed as well. And again, also with maneuverability, there actually isn't anything to see here of note except for the rather poor climb rate. Bear this in mind. This aircraft is probably best on the whole kept horizontal if you can try and get it in situations where it's pummeling other heavies pummeling bombers um, or aircraft that are in a low energy configuration if you start flying it up and down a lot you're probably going to suffer from what is a poor climb rate uh, and a fairly indifferent but not too shabby um, dive speed so bear that in mind so where does that place this heavy fighter well in my opinion, it's one of three true air superiority heavy fighters at tier eight. It has no ordnance. You're not going to be bothering to attack ground targets by and large. Um, and how it goes about establishing dominance is to get up close and personal and hit extremely hard with its four 37 millimeter cannons. And it can do this with decent airspeed and pretty decent maneuverability. One of the other air superiority fighters, the BVP-203, this, this does it quite differently. It snipes at long range with a pair of 30mm cannons, the range 3,000 feet, over 3,000 feet as you can see. 
The ME262 has something of the same um, style as the XP58 chain Lightning. It's faster under boost, although it has less boost and that needs to be managed quick, uh, carefully. And it has similarly hard hitting weaponry, 4 times 30 millimeter cannons. However, it has a sting, not in the tail in this case, but in the nose. It carries volleys of rockets, three volleys of rockets. Go head on with one of these or its tier 9 equivalent and you'll be sorry in almost any aircraft that you're in. Uh, so bear that in mind. Don't go head on at ME262s unless you're willing to uh, risk a face full of rockets. And then we start blending into progressively more and more ground attacking capability. The Westland P1056, the Pancake, even with its tiny Tims, certainly should be used to take out gun emplacements, for instance. Maybe a secondary target with both, both of them. Uh, the Dornier A1 file really does look like a, an air superiority fighter, but actually is best used as a multi-role, uh, exploiting the power of its four bombs and the twin Mustangs. Very good uh, multi-role components here. High ordnance loads. One of them's more maneuverable than the other. I've already said that you don't want to be going into a turn fight with either of these, though. So, dominate the high altitudes, keep high and fast, try to uh, not climb too much unless you absolutely have to, the climb rate is very poor on this aircraft and the dive speed won't necessarily get you away from trouble. But if you are on the alert and watching your minimap a lot and picking your uh, targets carefully, there's no reason why you shouldn't dominate many of the battles in which you fight with this fighter. Here we are back on the tarmac outside the hangar uh, and I'm going to show you how I've set my uh, XP-58 up. First thing to say is that my aircraft is specialised which means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available. However when you first get this aircraft what would you be missing? You have five slots on the equipment, you'd be missing one on the engine. And similarly for five consumable slots you'd be missing the one on the turret which is neither here nor there. So pretty much the aircraft will be very usable from the moment you get it. Now let's pop it back into specialist configuration and see what I've actually done. And you won't be at all surprised to see that I've put a gun sight in the cockpit slot. Um, this is ultimate level equipment. If we just have a look at all of the bonus characteristics, just glancing at those very quickly, I would probably change uh, one of them. Now I've set up the aircraft with a first aid kit. If you choose a fire extinguisher, and there is a slightly reduced uh, fire uh, resistance on this aircraft because I have an uprated engine, which we'll discuss in a moment, you might pick off the bottom of those characteristics um, an extra 5% resistance to injuries. Given that I've got a first aid kit, I would actually pick off the extra 3% accuracy, um, which is the second from bottom there, and I would probably remove the 10% chance of causing a fire bonus characteristic. Then I've opted to put a little bit more mobility onto this aircraft just to keep me on target a bit longer and help me with fights with certain heavies such as the pancake. Um, and this is actually an experimental piece of equipment as well uh, to give me even more uh, roll maneuverability and maneuverability in turns. And since I'm trying to improve the maneuverability of the aircraft, you won't be surprised to see I've selected off all of the maneuverability characteristics uh, from the bonus characteristics there. Those are the three that I would personally choose if I'm going down the route of trying to improve this aircraft's maneuverability. The main alternative choice here, if um, you want to do something different is probably go for polished skin and try and improve the airspeed of this aircraft. However, it's on the, it's in the middle. Um, if anything, it's one of the slightly slower um, uh, heavies in this class. That's not my choice, but if it is yours, then the polished skin is for you. If we just look at the maneuverability figure here, you might remember the base figure was 37 if you watched the spreadsheet section, and it's now gone up to 44, which is a very healthy improvement indeed. And we come to the engine. At the expense of a greater fire risk, I have put on an uprated engine to help the aircraft get around a little bit faster when it's cruising. Now, again, if you want to really improve the maneuverability of this um, aircraft, then the lightweight uh, power unit is the choice for you. And actually, I'm strongly minded to put one of those on. I might actually fly this aircraft in the test configuration with a lightweight power unit and see whether I think the reduction in cruise speed and the like um, is offset uh, more than sufficiently by the improvement in man maneuverability. As far as bonus char characteristics are concerned, uh, plus one percent cruise speed, engine cooldown rates, definitely pick that off. Um, maximum speed with boost, no. Acceleration without boost, no. 
half percent cruise speed. No, those are the three characteristics for sure that I would pick off this particular piece of equipment. This I think is a more certain choice. Um, you've got 30 seconds of boost. You will lose some by using the high speed gas turbine, but the benefits um, are under boost are much uh, greater um, in boost speed, uh, which we'll see in a moment. And these uh, bonus characteristics are exactly the ones I would pick. Get the engine to cool down much more quickly, 15% in total, and boost availability improved because there is a penalty, as I've just mentioned, for using a high speed gas turbine. Um, you lose a little bit of boost. So let's just go and have a look at the airspeeds. And we can see that that uh, boost duration has gone down from a base of 30 to about 27 seconds. But the boost speed has now gone up from uh, fairly indifferent, I think 484 it was, it was certainly that or thereabouts, to a rather useful 520. And I, that's the key piece of equipment on the engine as far as I'm concerned. Critically, I think the best choice by far for the forward firing weapon are the ultimate long gun barrels. And the reason for that is because the short range of 1,837 feet will really hamper you with you with these guns. Um, and you want to do everything you can to improve the range of them. Um, I've mentioned it's 1,837 feet at base. You can see I've got it up 2,076 here, which makes this, although still fairly short range, much more manageable. It's surprising how much difference 200 feet can make. And we look at the um, bonus characteristics. I would pick off here the 5% accuracy of forward firing weapons, absolutely have that. There's another 3% at the bottom, again, absolutely have that. And then um, of the others, 5% chance of inflicting critical damage is obviously not as good as 10%. Um, you might just want 5 more percent um, extra damage. Uh, the burst length, that might be a useful characteristic, I might swap to that one, worth considering. As far as consumables concerned, well, we have lost some um, resistance to fire. It's gone down from 50 to about 44 here. Nevertheless, as this is a two crew aircraft I've put on a first aid kit, it's really inconvenient if you have either crew member in, injured. Um, engine cooling, if you have any boost at all available, this will add 10 seconds to it. Almost a mandatory choice, I would suggest. And in this case, I've gone for the restart bottle in case I lose my engines. Universal ammunition in both the forward firing weapons and uh, the turret gun slots. Uh, I, I won't fire gold, but those, if you're willing to pay money, then you have those as options. Okay, so let's go and discuss pilot skills. I do use this as a crew trainer. If I were building a pilot for this or the other American heavies, for instance, although this is my F-86A pilot with the Sabre, the American Tier 10 fighter, I would certainly be looking to build this section here, but my first skill would be the aerodynamics expert. And if you are putting maneuverability on this aircraft as I have, then you might even decide that you'd go for aerobatics expert pretty quickly, maybe even second, depending on how much you want to improve the maneuverability. Uh, however, I would probably suggest what you want to do is go aerodynamics expert, engine guru one, marksman one, try and build up to engine guru two, use the points um, uh, as you're building up to engine guru, engine guru two usefully, perhaps on aerobatics expert, for instance, then take them off and put them on when you've got three points available and then build up to um, marksman two. Now, as this isn't a pilot specifically built for this aircraft, I haven't got anywhere near this, but it would be the next selection and a very long way into the future. If you're looking for another skill, I would probably take resilience. That's a skill that I particularly like. On the gunner, well, I've got a fairly standard approach to gunners, um, and I would always pick at least one of these two first. I normally pick defensive fire, although it is three points, and then another three points for precision gunner. Then you get into a bit of an, uh, uh, an awkward area. Um, currently, I've got one point available, but I'm very close to getting another point on this um, uh, gunner. I would probably put it on quick reflexes first. But as I then built up to another three points, beyond that, I would probably take off quick reflexes, Put uh, two points on armourer, which is a bit of a useless skill in my opinion. I really can't see that this actually does anything. It says it increases the burst length by of a turret by 50%, but has anyone ever run out of burst on a rear turret? I, I don't know. Maybe there's a bug in the game and that needs fixing. So this skill doesn't seem to be very useful, but it does lead, unfortunately, to what is a very useful skill, the ballistics expert, improving the range of fire of a turret. And then I would probably go back to quick reflexes, but that would be a long way in the future, of course. 
Okay, so that's how I've set up my XP58. I think it's about time we went and see how it performs in battle. The map for the upcoming battle is Plateau. It's the decisive hour variant with five sectors. They're laid out in a squashed five spots of the die configuration. Um, what we have around a central garrison, which is tactically important because it provides uh, access to the other sectors, uh, are a pair of repair air bases, and on the other axis, another pair of garrisons. So the way to win this map is to try and make sure you hold your local garrison and your local air base and the central garrison for longer than the enemy. If you hold those, and particularly the central garrison for most of the game, the chances are you'll take at least one, if not both, of the other two sectors as well. If we look at the order of battle, we can see that I'm top tier in my XP-58 for company. I have a Tu-10 bomber, an IL-10M. I'm going to call that a Grand Attack uh, Aircraft Hunter rather than a Grand Attacker per se. And we've also got a Vampire. That could be very useful for dominating the centre. Um, and an ME-265 Grand Attacker at Tier 7. Uh, the enemy lack one of the tier 8s already, we've got a bit of an advantage. They've got a BBP-203, which is another air superiority heavy fighter, but does it quite differently, as I mentioned. Uh, this one snipes at long range, I'm going to have to watch out for that. A J7W1 uh, multi-roll, good bombs, horrible guns. If I go low, I'll need to watch out for this. Uh, ME-329 ground attacker, and then a pair of ME-265s as the tier 7 ground attackers. Uh, lots of juicy targets, uh, particularly if I go low, but if I go low, I've got to remember I've got a very poor climb rate. Okay, let's see how this battle unfolded. But before that, I just want to mention that what you're about to see is not a World of Warplanes replay file. It's a native recording, and it may seem a little bit more jerky, therefore, because it's not smoothed. I hope that won't upset you. As this battle commences, we're going to gain altitude, as we should in this fight. It's one of the important uh, uh, advantages that you need to exploit, and we're going to head towards our local repair air base, which is on the right. And preferentially, I'll be looking for the air defence heavies. It's quite likely that enemy aircraft may also get to the base fairly quickly. If they're at high altitude, I'll consider taking those as well. There's the first of the heavies. It's a J4M. These are quite hard to hit, of course. And it's going to be especially so with these cannons. It's going to take a moment or two to try and get them leading correctly. What you need to be aiming is basically trying to hit into the cockpit of these aircraft. Go. Yeah. Go and look for the second one. Fortunately, it's not shooting at me. It could have been. It was in the right sort of uh, tra trajectory. And now I'm on its tail. And this is where this improved manoeuvrability that I've put on the aircraft is showing. Uh, its value. I'll get a fire on the aircraft. Uh, just struggling a little, so I take care to aim properly. I was going down for the BVP, but then I spot something flying high. It's a bomber. This is uh, my primary, one of my primary roles. I chase after the bomber. Something else is going after it, and because I've extended the range of my weapons, I'm able to open up at 2,000 feet as opposed to 1,800 feet and that allows me to secure the kill. The turn back to... Th I noticed that there's a heavy. It's a Ki-94-1, and that means now I'm on its tail, it's doomed. I'm more manoeuvrable. I'm just as fast, if not faster. It's an easy kill. Swing round, and I find another heavy, and this one is the human in the BVP-203, and I do want to get this out for obvious reasons, because if he's able to snipe me at range, ruin my day. Some nice shooting there as he tries to dive uh, to evade me. You see the airfield is under threat so the enemy are being fairly quick to try and to overturn the advantage we've established at the game and I head towards the LA-9. I know it's busy so I should be able to shoot it provided it remains busy without it trying to evade uh, me and then trying to get on my tail. Some nice shooting there. The LA-9 goes into a death spiral, but they have the enemy has actually been able to take this uh, base. F2G presents itself in front of me. I don't try and turn with it. There's a Ki-61, is that? Ki-84 on my tail, so I just outpace it and I fly away.
and I go back up for a multi-roll that's sailing along oblivious to my presence. That actually blew up uh, as I went past it. I was about to shoot it with the rear gun, as you saw. That puts me nicely onto a bomber. So I assist in damaging and destroying that. More targets over the central base. Could have gone for either of these aircraft, but the 203 is the one that I fear mo more. So I shoot that down for a second time. Make sure I'm not in the vicinity of the J7W1. And I go up for the heavy, which is the KI-94-1 again. Should be an easy kill. And down he goes. Since I'm pointing downwards, I spot a ground attacker. And I see the J7W1 is in my vicinity. That's got nasty, nasty cannons. I don't want that to shoot me, so I try and finish it off. Look for a rear gun kill, and I get it. Now I can go down for the ground attacker. Turns out to be the human. He's quite lucky I don't finish him off. And in having, fa having failed to finish him off, the enemy have actually got the scepter. Now I could try and save this Grand Attacker, but I'm fairly confident about being able to seize it back. So I destroy him so he can't go off and do anything else which is inconvenient to us. And I begin to labour upwards. Another tricky aircraft to shoot, a BVP. Managed to get a fire on it, which is good. I also managed to make it evade me. So I didn't get a chance to fire rockets at me. And now I use the rear gunner. Now this isn't a deliberate move by me. I just happened to be in this orientation and I didn't see the point in correcting it whilst I was shooting at the J4M. It breaks off as I fly out of the center, so now I get myself into a proper aspect. Decide to fly away. There's a bomber and a fighter that I could take. The bomber is my priority, so up I go. Down it goes. Let's see what else is here. BVP again. And again, I get a fire on it for a second time. Shoot it with the rear gun. And it blows up. Nasty aircraft that with its air to air rockets. I didn't uh, want it to be around me for too long. Now I can see ground attackers in an F2G. principle the most maneuverable aircraft is the one that I need to get out first. Shoot the F2G, then I go for the J7. Put him on fire. He blows up and that's the Maguire's medal going through. Now we're going to try and get this ground attacker. Get up above it so it's an easier shot for me and also there's no risk of a bomb trap. Blows up and that's a winged legend. Decide not to try and pursue the uh, fighter or multi roll. Want to go up for the um, bomber. Now, I'm climbing too steeply here. Much better to try and keep it around about 30 degrees. And now it's a fairly nasty chase for the bomber. The Horton's in front of me, but you know the Horton can be very quick, and I just fly straight past him. It's probably out of boost, to be fair. And that's the Hero of the Sky Badge gone through as I secure another bomber kill. Quick check of our progress. Just looking to do uh, more damage now because I think the game is probably secure, though you can't rely on it. There's still a fairly long way to go. Out the BVP again.
F2G, I don't fancy its chances of surviving currently, but I may as well fly towards it. And indeed, it does get shot down. The enemy is massed over the center. Let's go and see if we can deal some final damage. Decide I will take too long to get up to the bomber, so I'll go down for ground attackers. Don't quite finish that one off. Get assistance. My teammates shoot down the other ground attacker. There's nothing more to be done here, and the game is very nearly over. And it finishes before I can get a bead on the air defence fighter. So there we go. 16,955 personal points. Uh, fairly good haul of medals. And you got to see what a manoeuvrability build can do on the XP-58. Uh, a satisfying game. Unfortunately, at the end of that battle, I was disconnected, as you can see from this message in the server. So I took a screen grab of what I could before um, uh, I had to restart the game. Let's work with this. So we grossed 323,907 credits, or silver if you prefer. That's also the net figure as it happens because the aircraft wasn't destroyed, no repair expenses, and I was using prepaid consumables. Uh, aircraft experience of 6,330, 316 free experience, and three tokens. Uh, two of those were for the Hero of the Sky and for the Winged Legend. I think probably the other one was Maguire's Medal. We look at the class specific missions. Uh, two of them we can see one complete, one not, not complete. Uh, however, this is Aerial Targets Destroyed, which is the same here. That's 16, that's fully complete, and that's why it's five chevrons. 16,955 personal points, two sectors captured. As I mentioned, the 16 aerial targets destroyed. Uh, 7,795 damage to aerial targets with 23 critical hits. You can't see it, but I didn't lose the aircraft. Uh, and 540 capture points, which I can't break down on this occasion. Uh, a pretty decent battle. And that brings me to the end of my look at the Lockheed XP-58 Chain Lightning, a true air superiority heavy fighter at Tier 8, capable of dealing massive damage with those quadruple 37mm cannons. Got a fairly pokey rear gunner as well, which is useful. On the whole, you'll want to try and keep this aircraft fast, probably at high altitude for most of the game. You'll need to pick your low-level targets quite carefully because the climb speed is poor on this aircraft. But if you do play it in the true air superiority role, there's no reason why you shouldn't do very well in this plane, and that's the reason it's a popular choice. Well, I hope you found that useful, and if you did, that you'll come back and see my future content. But until then, this is the Noble Q, signing out.